Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And Carol Gilligan's one of my heroes as well, for sure. Um, uh, and hopefully you all will hear her influence in uh, much of what I talk about this morning. So good morning. It's a real delight to be here with you all um, today. And it's been uh, really, oh, I gotta figure out how to work this thing. Let me make sure I can advance my slides. Oh, there we go. Um, it's, I'm just, I, it's such a privilege to be here. I've never been to Ireland before, so this has been very exciting for me to get to make this trip. So I want to thank John and Pat and uh, Bernadine for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to come and be in Ireland and also to um, attend this conference. And I've been learning so much already from so many of you, from the presentations, from the breakout sessions, from the conversations. It's just a thrill for me. And I'll say, coming from Boston, it also feels like uh, an important place for me to visit because there's quite the Boston-Ireland connection. Um, there's a very strong uh, Irish influence in the Boston area. And one example of that I want to show you is, so we're a little bit of a sports fanatic town, and the Red Sox is our sort of famous uh, baseball team that everyone loves. And I wasn't a baseball fan until I moved to Boston, and now I'm a huge baseball fan. I'm a huge Boston Red Sox fan. But if you go to Fenway, where the games are played, you also see, this is the Boston Red Sox hat, right? But you'll also see lots of these all throughout the park. And they're the Irish version of the Boston Red Sox um, fandom. So there's a whole Irish fan community uh, who are the Boston Red Sox fans as well. So I feel like this is an important connection for me to get to come to Ireland being from Boston because there seems there's a strong relationship. So another thrill to be here. Um, that what I'm going to be talking with you about this morning, this kind of you might be thinking, what does she mean? Put the relationship back in the youth mentoring relationships. Hopefully you'll get a sense of that by the end of this. But I wanted to let you know I'm drawing from kind of a series of studies um, to uh, uh, bring these ideas to you this morning. And it's a whole range of qualitative studies that I've done over the years, dating back to the dissertation study that was referred to in my introduction, which was going to Big Brothers Big Sisters and saying, can I talk to the matches that get you excited about going to work in the morning, like really represent the work that you're trying to accomplish? Did that for my dissertation, did a follow-up study, which was the opposite. Can I talk to matches where things didn't go so well, where they broke up, and you really want to understand what happened there? And that sent me down a path of looking at mentoring relationships over time. So I interviewed um, 67 mentor youth relationships and their caregivers over every three months for a year, and then every six months after that for up to two years, or however long the match lasted. So I got to watch mentoring relationships grow and develop over time. Um, and also get the perspective of caregivers, which was really innovative at that time. People weren't really talking to caregivers as if they weren't a part of the equation or conversation. And then have followed that up with a study that um, I've been doing or did with uh, my colleague Tom Keller, who's probably here in the audience somewhere. If not, he'll be here later, on relationships that um, ended early. And we called it the study to analyze relationships. That's the STAR study, because nobody wants to be in a study about relationships that break up. So we couldn't call it that, because that wouldn't go very well. So it was the study to analyze relationships. But what what we did is get matches at the beginning of the match and then tracked which ones, when, when relationships broke up, then kind of <coughs> swooped in and did surveys and interviews to try to understand what happened. So I really devoted my career to understanding the, how relationships work in the youth mentoring um, uh, uh, process and trying to really understand and unpack that. All right. So. What got me interested in this was in, a, in graduate school in one of my first semester seminars. There's a, the professors came in and did a, a whole rotation of research, and here's current ideas and what we're thinking. And the, at that time, risk and resilience was all the rage. And you can then do the math and date me, and you can know how old I am when I say that. But that was all the rage in youth work at that time. It was all talking about risk and resilience. And the professor came through and recited this finding, which I then researched and found it's an incredibly robust finding in the psychological literature. And we all know this. It's just young people who have a relationship, a strong relationship with at least one adult. Doesn't have to be their parent, although that's certainly great when, when it's that. Um, but kids, they need to have at least one adult that they can really count on. And kids who have that can weather all kinds of adversities. And name the adversity and it's been studied. And you'll find that the kids who have that one strong relationship you know, did better than kids who didn't. Um, and there's been a longitudinal study. It started with back in early work of women who were pregnant, and they followed those children. And, and um, that's where this original finding comes from. So it's an incredibly robust finding, and it really sparked the mentoring movement. And off the mentoring movement went. And in fact, the promise of the mentoring movement 
movement is that through mentoring, we're going to create these kinds of relationships that were found to be so powerful in these um, studies on risk and resilience. One of the issues is that, and I'll get to this, is that these were natural mentoring relationships. And in mentoring programs, we're trying to engineer them. So we've got some special challenges there that I really want to address. But that robust finding and all this enthusiasm for mentoring sparked a movement. And in the States, we had these um, uh, ad campaigns. January is National Mentoring Month in the United States, and there are always these fabulous ad campaigns that came out. This one was from many years ago. It was when the March of the Penguins was a hit movie, and so they capitalized on that and had these cute penguins. And um, these kinds of slogans of share what you know, become a mentor. It doesn't take special skills to mentor a young person. Just a willingness to listen, offer encouragement, and share what you've learned about life. So I love this ad for recruiting volunteers. It's lovely, it gets you excited, and you think you wanna, wanna sign up for that, but there are um, a couple of challenges with this. One is that all of this enthusiasm got us in the States very focused on closing the mentoring gap. And that meant we identified all the kids who didn't say they didn't have a mentor, and it was a really big number, and how many um, youth our mentoring programs could serve, and that was a really small number, and then the race was on to close that gap. So what that resulted in was a push to just sort of get as many kids in mentoring relationships as quickly as we can. And the notion behind that is somehow mentoring is really easy. Relationships are easy, right? Mentoring relationships are easy. We're just going to put all adults have to do is show up and share what they know and have a willingness and be encouraging. And these great things are going to happen because we know that kids do better under these kind of conditions. Now, I don't know about you all, but I don't find relationships to be all of that easy. And in fact, if we found relationships to be so easy, we wouldn't have divorce rates that we have. We'd all be friends with everybody we ever knew all along the way. <laughs> They're just not that easy. So there's a conflation, there's an issue here. Yes, relationships are incredibly powerful, but they're not necessarily so easy. To engineer these powerful relationships is actually quite challenging. And um, the big take home message from my talk today is I think we need to get really serious about how we engineer those relationships and what kind of knowledge and science we need to be able to do that. Okay, so the March of the Penguins and all this enthusiasm led to this. Um, notion that mentoring works, and it does. And there's a lot of good evidence that shows that mentoring works. And it's a broad-based intervention. It works as prevention as well as intervention. A range of young people, of, of, uh, lots of different kinds of mentoring work. It can be group-based, individual. So we've got some good evidence that mentoring works. And that, again, fueled this enthusiasm to close that gap and get as many kids matched as possible as quickly as possible. But then there's a counter voice um, that's coming along. Oh, let's see that's coming along that is making a different argument. And Jean Rhodes, one of the international, in many ways, the grandmother of mentoring uh, research, wrote a book recently called Older and Wiser. And she really takes a hard look at the evidence on mentoring and looks at the effect sizes, which in research what that means is, OK, so you see some improvements, but how much? of an improvement. Is it just a little improvement or is it a big improvement? And what she sees in looking across the meta-analysis is the improvements kind of across the board are pretty small and they haven't really budged. So now after 20 years in the states of really focusing on mentoring program practices, trying to talk about um, evidence-based mentoring and quality mentoring and all this, the effect sizes haven't really budged. They're about the same. So this led Jean and other colleagues um, down this path of sort of saying, well, I don't think mentoring actually works, and we need to redo mentoring. And one of the um, results of that is there's a lot of talk about um, turning uh, mentoring, mentor, mentors into paraprofessionals, training them for specific tasks, really defining what the outcome is going to be. And this has been sort of pitted in opposition to what has been called the friendship model of mentoring, and that this is the way we're going to rectify that. Okay, I'm going to offer a different argument for these modest effect sizes and say, you know, what does this mean? We've got mentoring works on one side, and we've got these meta-analysis that say that it works. Then we have this very um, rigorous assessment of all of this evidence and saying it doesn't really work that well. Um, we really need to rethink the whole, uh, whole um, process here. So what do we make of this? And my assessment or analysis of this is that there's actually a couple of factors that are going on here. And one is how we talk about <coughs> outcomes, how we think about the outcomes of mentoring and how we measure that, and also how we think about relationships and how we talk about relationships. So one of the reasons that we see these, um, uh, these modest effect sizes is that mentoring is a broad-based intervention. So if you have a group of kids, and I've seen this in my interviews, so you take a, a group of young people, they get matched with a mentor. So one, one of those young people is doing just fine in school, but they're having 
having conflicts with their parents. And the mentoring relationship might actually help the conflict with their parents. There's another young person who's not doing so great in school, maybe has a lot of friends, but like school's kind of an issue. The mentor gets in there and sort of figures out how to structure some things and help that young person and see some improvements there. Another kid I interviewed that has an amazing story about that. When you ask, give those kids surveys, one kid's going to show an improvement in one domain, another kid's going to show improvement in another domain, that's going to wash out in averages. So on average, it looks like the effects of mentoring are actually quite modest. And I think we need to get more sophisticated in how we think about outcomes and what we're measuring and for whom, and really look at what the effects, is, effects may be. Um, so that's one thing, an outcome. And then the other is relationships. What do we mean by relationships? We've been far too facile, we've been far too, we think we know what that means, we think we know what that looks like, and we haven't really built a science of the actual relationship and mentoring relationships. We've talked a lot about some of the processes, and I'll share some of that today, but that really needs to be added up into something larger and a clearer science about what, is it, what does it actually take to engineer these relationships and what are mentors actually doing when they're doing, doing this well. Okay, so outcomes. I'm going to skip over this slide in the interest of time. Those are so one, another way of uh, why I think part of the problem resides in this notion of relationships is what do we mean by relationship? So one of the things that happens in mentoring is everything is mentoring. Like it's all different kinds of relationships and I'm a big temp person. One of the fiercest arguments that happen on the youth mentoring listserv of which is practitioners and policymakers and researchers was how do you define mentoring? And it was like, oh, no, it's this, no, it's that. Well, that's not mentoring, that's something else. And it was, you know, like, so, I'm a big tent person. I actually think lots of things, in fact, are mentoring. But then if we're going to measure it and see whether or not it works, we need to be much more specific about what kind of mentoring we're talking about and making sure that we're actually measuring and evaluating the right thing. And I also wanted to help us get out of this notion of that there's one kind of mentoring that might be the effective form of mentoring. So um, Tim Cavell, Sam McQuillan, and I wrote an article last summer um, on uh, these um, uh, on trying to uh, look at this, um, <coughs> let me get this back, to look at the mentoring field and kind of offer a framework to help us hold the different kinds of mentoring relationships and try to get us to think more carefully about then how we go about measuring them and thinking about their effectiveness. So on the one hand are what we ended up calling, we, we use this old saying, if something can be an end in and of itself or it can be a means to an end. And so we talked about mentoring as being an end unto itself, that the goal of a mentoring program might be to foster a safe, supportive, nurturing relationship with a young person. And the research evidence is pretty clear that kids need that and that's really good for kids. And so then the focus there becomes on how do you engineer that? How do you make that relationship safe, supportive, stable, last the length that you're promising a young person and you know, have the qualities um, fall in line with that? The mentoring can be used for lots of other purposes. It can be much more specified, it can be time limited, it can be focused on a particular problem, and that's a different kind of mentoring relationship. And we ended up calling those mentoring relationships as means to an end. They're a relationship that's in the service of some kind of specific outcome that you're trying to target and change and make a difference for a young person. And within that, we talked about two different kinds, kind of these problem focus, where there's a problem you're trying to help a young person with, that there's an agreed, agreed upon goal, that this is a, an area that that young person wants to make some change, or it could be transition. So maybe a young person is making a transition from elementary to middle school, or making a transition out of the foster care system, or making some other kind of transition, and you have a mentor who comes in to help the young person with that transition. That's going to be a more time-limited, targeted, focused kind of um, approach. When we talk about mentoring the states, at least, this is all thrown into one bucket. And it gets really hard to then talk about what works and what's effective because these are really different kinds of relationships. And this is what I mean by we got to really think, we can't be so glib about what we mean by relationship. We really need to specify what it is we're talking about, what's the purpose of the relationship, and what do we think is going to be achieved there. Okay, so relationship as a means to an end would be these examples that I gave. Um, and Gene Rhodes and Sam McQuillan are working on um, training mentors in kind of using really good science about paraprofessionals and training mentors to use mental health apps to um, target because there's a recognition that there are many, at least in the United States, our mental health system is not so robust. 
and there are a lot of families who don't have access and they turn to mentoring programs and there's an opportunity there for mentoring programs to offer some supported, supportive mental health services. I think it's a really interesting innovation. It's a particular kind of mentoring relationship. Um, Tim Cavell has a Lunch Buddies program where it's about trying to reduce peer victimization and so he has college students come and have lunch with um, uh, kids who have been bullied and picked on and singled out and try to elevate their social status in the eyes of the young people. That's not about the mentor-youth relationship as much as it is it's changing the social ecology for the child to get that child to be out of the seat of being the kid who gets picked on. So that mentoring is a means to, and we're going to use this relationship in the service of a specified outcome. Okay, and then there's mentoring relationships as an end, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time um, talking about. Are kind of these are where where I really don't want us to see us give up these, which is kind of where things we're feeling like they're heading in the states is this notion is it all has to become this very targeted, focused mentoring, and I'm like, meanwhile, there's a lot of science pushing us in the other direction of mentoring relationships as an end in and of themselves. And if there's anything I learned in the pandemic, it only reified my understanding of the importance of relationships and social connection in all of our lives. And I have a now 17-year-old daughter who was 15 when the pandemic started, and being in her bedroom on Zoom going to school was not a great adolescence. Um, you know, you, those were not great 15 to 17 years. It was very difficult for her. That very time when she needed to be out making all kinds of connections and widening her social net and her world just really narrowed. So I saw the effects of that personally. I felt the effects of that personally. And we're hearing a lot about the, the um, huge spikes in uh, mental health issues for young people and for all of us, quite frankly. So we've, we've seen the cost of social isolation. It's really profound. And we knew it before the pandemic, but I feel like we, kn we know it in a, in a new way now. But, but even before the pandemic, the brain science was get, is getting clearer and clearer. We are hardwired to be in relationship with each other, to connect. That's how we grow and thrive. We need these kind of supportive relationships. We know the ravages of loneliness and social isolation. It's now, um, I think it's been found, it's on par with smoking in terms of health risks for adults. Loneliness is the same, has the same sort of health detriments, the same level of health detriments as smoking does for adults. So it's not just an emotional thing. It, it takes a physical toll on us as well when we don't have these social connections. So we've, there's lots of science that's reminding us of the importance of these kinds of social connections. And there's this work on, many of you may be familiar with this work, on what gets called adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. And there's been a lot of work that has been you know, kind of showing us what the impact of those are and the multiplicative effect of those. Well, interestingly now, the ACEs people are talking about PACEs, positive childhood experiences, and the things that can counter <coughs> ACEs. And guess what? Once again, we learn what's one of the big things that the ACEs, now PACEs people are promoting, supportive relationships with adults for young people is what, once again, we found makes a difference for young people under these kind of adverse conditions. So it feels like we have to, at least in the States, keep getting hit over the head with this, that these relationships really matter and the power of connection. Um, and I think part of what's gotten in this way is how we think about relationships. So in um, the states, we have this very independent notion, and I grew up in Texas, that's where I was raised, and we have the sayings like, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and it's really rugged individualism. And when you have that kind of framework, you really think about relationships as these, these, these me in a mechanistic way. There are things that you give and get, and what it does for you, and it's, it's a much more mechanistic view of relationship. And I think how we talk about youth mentoring relationships often sounds like this. It has this more mechanistic sound to it. And there, this is the thinking of you have to have a strong sense of self before you can really be in a relationship with another person. It's, that, again, that really rooted in an individualistic kind of framework. Well, then feminist theories, and actually now people who do research on infant development, have found that's where this hardwired to connect. We actually have a sense of self as infants. Infants have a sense of self and can distinguish themselves from others. The old psychoanalytic thinking was we had to learn how to do that. We don't have to learn how to do that. We're born with that. But we're also born with a profound push to connect with others. And we also, babies can tell. They'll show that really profound infant research where they show videotapes of the infant's mother. So it's like a, you know, uh, you're looking at a, a screen and sometimes the mother's live and sometimes she's a video. And they can tell from the physical ways that the baby tries to engage with the mother, the baby can tell the difference. So we, we understand um, connection. It is how we grow and thrive and how we, it's our survival. It's how we become who we are. So if you think of a self as a self in relation and connection as oxygen, 
for us as human beings. And you think about them as actually one of the, the, the means by which we grow into who we are, who we, the means by which we become who we are. It's a really different, you think about relationships in a different way. It opens up, well, okay, well, so then what do the conditions need to be to foster that kind of a meaningful relationship? I'm going to skip this as another parallel. I'm reading this book called Braiding Sweetgrass, which is incredible. And it's a woman who's a botanist, um, who's a Native American woman who's a botanist. And she talks about the uh, relationship between uh, giving up her Native worldview, adopting the scientific worldview, then reclaiming her Native worldview. And she talks about origin stories. And in Braiding Sweetgrass, the origin story um, for her people is a woman falling from the sky and the earth receiving the woman and um, saving her and helping her grow. And our origin story is, uh, for Judeo-Christians like myself, is a woman getting thrown out for eating the apple. And so you set up sort of adversarial relationship with the earth uh, from the get-go versus hers. Is the, the earth is, and humans are in a reciprocal relationship. So I just offer this. I said I was going to skip it and then I couldn't resist because it's a really great book. <laughs> I recommend it. But I say this because our worldviews matter. They really shape how we think about things. And so if you think about humans and, and the earth as an ongoing reciprocal relationship and we can't survive without each other, we wouldn't be doing the things to the earth that we're doing. Right? Our worldview matters. It really drives our behavior. So I think the worldview of relationships really matters. So if we center the relationship, put the relationship back in youth mentoring relationships, and take this notion of relationship very seriously, where does it get us? So one place it gets is if you're thinking about that one part of the um, relationship idea that I was telling you about, which is the, the relationship as an end in and of itself. That's really what I'm talking about here. And I don't want to discount or say that those other forms of mentoring don't matter. They do. I, again, big tent. But I really want to focus in on that relationships as um, uh, an end in and of itself then the goal becomes promoting positive youth development. It's not these specified outcomes. It's like, what's the goal of parenting? It's good development, right? You want your kid to grow up. And as Freud would say, his definition of healthy development was to be able to live and to love and to work. So the goal of a you know, supportive relationships is that we're able to love and work. If we're connected with others and we have good, healthy relationships, then we're able to love and to work. And that's really the goal here. And so we need to build a strong science to really support the promotion of these kinds of relationships. I think we need to then focus on relational processes and what mentors actually do in their relationships with mentees. And that would then inform what programs need to do to help support mentors in that endeavor. We got to attend to the context within which these relationships are um, growing and hopefully thriving, and we have to attend to the mentoring system. And I'm going to take a few minutes and go through these. So one thing is that um, uh, I, I'm borrowing from the Paces people their notion. They call it a safe. They call it safe, stable, nurturing relationships. I'm going to call them safe, supportive, nurturing relationships. But I think for us to achieve achieve this mentoring uh, relationship as an end, they have to be safe. They have to be um, safe supportive and nurturing. And safe means that mentors have to be committed to, the, if not the kid. And in the, I've done um, work on um, community-based mentoring relationships, lots of work with Big Brother, Big Sister, and now also youth-initiated mentoring relationships where young people select their own mentor and then the mentoring program matches them up. And the interesting thing is the mentors in the youth-initiated mentoring program enter the relationship committed to that kid because that's why they agreed to do it. And in Big Brother, Big Sister, the mentor enters the relationship committed to the idea of mentoring. And what I found is in the relationships that last, at some point that commitment has to shift to being committed to that kid. It can't be a commitment to the idea. It has to be a commitment to that kid. So the commitment to the idea might get them through the rough patches and get them to the other side, but at some point that commitment's got to shift and they got to get invested in that kid. So the mentor has to be committed. They have to do what they say even when the going gets tough, and that's not easy. Adults give up far too quickly, and that's the role of program support, is we really have to help adults hang in there. Adults have to be dependable. They have to do what they'll, they say they're going to do. So if they say they're going to be there, they have to show up. Michael Karcher did this great work on school-based mentoring where he found that even mentors who showed up over the course of the nine months that they made their commitment but were unpredictable, so didn't show up a couple of times and the kid thought they were going to show up, but then they showed back up the next time, those relationships were not effective. It was when the mentors showed up when they said they were going to show up is what mattered. So adults, we, these adult, adults have to be somebody the young person can actually really count on for this to be a safe, and I call this safety. This isn't just like a nice thing to have. It's foundational. It's what makes the relationship safe for the young person. And the mentor has to have a sense of cultural awareness and be skilled at navigating cultural differences. In the States, at any rate, in our formal mentoring programs, many times there are cross-cultural relationships, cross-race, cross-class, and I've just watched mentors put their foot in it over 
over and over again. And that's not safe for young people. Young people then experience <laughs> microaggressions and forms of um, interpersonal racism and those kinds of interactions when mentors don't really have support to understand how to deal with those kinds of differences. Okay, I'm going to skip over these quotes. Dependable, show up when you say you're going to sh show up. We've got to really work hard to prevent early closures of mentoring relationships where mentors bail on young people. I could do a whole talk on that. I've done a ton of research. Um, and when mentors do bail, then programs really need to step in and do the cleanup, and oftentimes programs don't do that. So if we take the relationship seriously, somebody made a promise to a child that they didn't keep, we then have a responsibility to clean that up and try to make it right with that young person. And so it's, if, if we really center relationships and honor them and think about them, we'd be doing our program practices, I think, in a deeper way. Um, this is the culturally rare. I'll put a pitch here for Bernadette Sanchez, who's developing a training on, um, uh, she calls them culturally smart uh, relationships. And so she's developing a training with Big Brother Big Sisters, and they've been testing it and getting some good early results from that, which I think is a really important innovation. Okay, so they need to be supportive and nurturing, and um, uh, I'm going to skip this and say, you know, there are processes that um, I've identified and done some work on things like mentors being authentic, mentors um, having positive <laughs> regard for the young person, social support is something that's been talked a lot about in mentoring. I think it's one of the mechanisms of adults really getting in there and trying to understand what are some of the, the things that the young person needs and offering that. And in these community-based relationship as a end in and of itself, there's a lot of opportunity to get to know a young person and to get a sense of what's really, what skills you have that you think you can be helpful to this young person or how you can connect the young person with somebody who has what they need to help them um, develop. But you really become a steward for that young person of uh, being invested in their growth and development and doing what you can to help facilitate that. Um, okay, so uh, just an example of positive regard. These are mentors I interviewed. He's, he's, she's a bright light. He's a good kid. These are the kinds of things I heard from mentors who went the distance. They got involved in that kid and they really, they see the light. Even when they see the challenges, kids are running away from home. They're standing them up for their mentoring out, you know, all kinds of things. But he's a good kid. I see that kid. He's a good kid, right? It's that, it's adults who can do that with young people that we really need. Um, okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip. I'll also put in a plug for fun that what young people, when I interview youth, when they ask, when I ask them what they want from mentoring, this is what they say they want from mentoring, <laughs> right? And, and it, so we could say, oh, that's really cute and that's kids, but fun is actually really important for child development. It's really important for kids to have positive experiences and for them to get to feel good. And I've heard parents who got mentors for their kids because they wanted their kids. I can't take my kid to the aquarium or take them to the park. I've got too much going on. I just, I don't have the hours. I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the time. My kid needs those experiences. That's very, that is nurturing and sustaining. And I talked to young people who said, it's like a relief to go to my mentor, go out with my mentor, and I just don't think about stuff for a while. Our kids need that. They need those kinds of spaces, and we can really minimize that in a way that's not helpful, I think. Okay, they need to be collaborative, and I'm smack out of time, so I'm just going to go on and say, and empathy. So this is one of the things I'm really interested in and want to kind of pursue going forward is if I had to kind of put my money on one thing, there's a lot of um, research in the health professions now on um, doing these, like, my, these, um, brief trainings with healthcare workers on empathy, and when they do that, they're more effective providers. And I think that, um, again, thinking about building a science of mentoring, if we could really get clarity on how we train mentors in empathy and get them to do this well, I think that would take us a long way down the road. So that's something I'm super interested in. I have a paper that I wrote on defining that. Okay, so let me wrap up. I'm just gonna um, wrap up so we can take some questions. Oh, last point is the mentoring system. Oop, let me go back. Ah. I can't make it go back. Okay. Well, you saw you saw like a, fl a flash of it. It's like this. I'll I'll narrate. It's like this triangle, and the kids in the middle, and Tom Keller, who's back there. This is his model. Um, the child is in the middle, and we we often think of mentoring as a mentor youth relationship, and it is. But I've interviewed caregivers. Caregivers are in the mix. They're a huge and very important force in the mentoring relationship, and the program staff are a huge and very important force in the mentoring relationship. And we've really got to attend to all those relationships. And if we're going to have mentors who are out there being these sort of safe, supportive adults for young people, we have to have program staff who know how to do that, who can support them in that endeavor. And so they need lots of training and support and nurturing of their own. So that's that attending to the mentoring system idea. So let me just say, so the big idea, again, I want to leave you with is I think we need to really take this notion of relationships seriously and honor it and really um, value relationship and also build a much stronger science. We've got studies that show the processes. I've done some of that work, Julia Price. 
Um, Bernadine has done some of that work here. Um, Kelsey Dean in New Zealand. So there are folks that are, are where we're, you know, the edges are starting to come together, but I really think what needs to happen, what would kind of take us to the next level is have a much clearer science about what skills it does take special skills, so I'll say that. It does take special skills to be a mentor. You have to be an adult who can provide a safe, supportive, and nurturing relationship to a young person. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody can. Um, so we need to find the people who can or find the people who have the potential to do it and train and support them to get it right. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.